The real reason we are here tonight, a conversation with best-selling author Janet Ivanovich and Sacramento Bee senior writer Alan Pierleone. Enjoy the evening. Here's Al and Janet. Okay. You better behave yourself. <laughs> um, I, I love writing, and I can't wait to get up in the morning and to go back into that world, you know, the world of Stephanie Plum um, or whatever. Uh, I have uh, a co-author now, whatever world I'm privileged to be in. So um, it's easy to get motivated to write. It's the world's best job, and, uh, and the pay ain't bad. You know, so it turns out, you know, you don't give them a book, they don't give you any money. And uh, so that's motivation, too. You were in Los Angeles for a few years before you came to Sacramento. I imagine that's a whole different planet for someone like yourself to be in Jersey in the spring weather. Um, yeah, well, although I, I, love, uh, I love coming out to California. I love L.A. We were in L.A. for three days because we have uh, a couple of television projects cooking. And I mean, you know, you never know if it's going to happen, but um, we're looking to take Stephanie to television. We're hoping. <laughs> and uh, so we were taking meetings, as they say, in LA. Take Down 20 was released two days ago. So why don't we start our conversation with you telling us about, about the book and her, you called Stephanie, quote, a train wreck of a heroine. <laughs> what is she up to this time, Al? Um, you know, the usual stuff, trying to decide between a couple hot guys and uh, hanging out with Lula and, and Grandma and, and all that. But in this book, um, how, how many of you have already read the book? How many are going to read the book? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can stay then. <laughs> um, there's a, a mobster in this book that I, lo I love the bad guy in this book because he's this uh, cool little old guy, wears a bow tie, sings Sinatra, and everybody loves him. Everybody just loves him. I mean, okay, so yeah, he kills people, you know, but that's... <laughs> I mean, it's his job, you know, and it's, and it's Trenton, so, I mean, who, is it really so extraordinary anyway? But um, it turns out that somebody um, videoed him uh, running over a guy uh, twice, and, <laughs> and then he got out and choked him. And so um, while he's done pretty good at escaping, you know, uh, t not taking the rap for a lot of crimes, they, they sort of have him on this one. And uh, Vinny was dumb enough to let him out on bail. And, um, and so, of course, and he's just, and you know, our little mobster has decided that he really doesn't want to go to jail, so he, nobody can find him. And Stephanie is the person that has to go find this guy. Uh, and to complicate it, it turns out he's Joe Morelli's godfather. <laughs> So, um, which allows me to bring in Grandma Bella. Was, yeah. So I really, I really had a lot of fun with the book. And then, um, and then there's a giraffe named Kevin who is um, running around Trenton. Well, not all of, he stays pretty much in one neighborhood. And, uh, and I'm not gonna tell you about Kevin, you know, because then you wouldn't wanna read the book. Oh, I think they would. <laughs> you know, before I go on, there's, you mentioned Vinny was dumb enough to let the, the guy post bail, and there's a character who is, is kind of sleezes around, and he, he, he comes in now and then, and he does these awful, reprehensible things, and he kind of creeps away, and, and for my reading taste, it's like, I want some more Vinny. Tell me, tell, tell us a little bit more about Vinny and what kind of a guy he is. Yeah. Well, he's a perv. <laughs> 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 Vinny is the boil on the backside of Stephanie's family tree. He's <laughs> um, and, and here's the problem, you know, with the Plum series. I only have 300 pages. And there are all these characters that live in the world of Plum. And 
I have to pick and choose, you know, what characters I'm going to bring forward. And, I, you know, and I have to say, I think, you know, Vinny has not had sufficient time lately. I think point well taken. Um, I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, next book, you're going to have to endure Vinny because of him. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> Stephanie became a bounty hunter almost by accident. And now she works out of her cousin Benny's Dale Bond's office in Trenton, New Jersey. We talked about this when, when, when we chatted on the phone a couple of weeks ago. What is it about Stephanie that endears her so much to so many of her readers? I mean, everybody loves Stephanie. What is it? Um, I think she, first of all, she's, um, she's very average. She's, we all know who Stephanie is. And there's all a part of us that, you know, that's very much like Stephanie. She's, um, she's just somebody out there putting one foot in front of the other, trying to get through the day. She's not perfect, but she tries hard. I think um, one of the characteristics that makes her very popular um, is her resiliency. Um, we all would like to be resilient like Stephanie. I, I think that we have, um, you know, there's a lot of scary stuff happening in the world today. And there are a lot of reasons to be depressed, um, just the normal condition. We all have sickness in the family. We all have, um, you know, lose our jobs, all kinds of things. And, um, but what the Plum series does is it shows that these normal, average people can get through the day. And, um, and it shows the, the good parts, that they have family and friends, and they're there for each other. They have each other's back. Okay, you know, they might be annoying sometimes, and, but basically, this is, this is a series about good people, good, honest people. And, um, and it has a lot of humor in it. And the humor is, um, reflects um, social issues. It reflects, okay, there's a little, I did grow up on I Love Lucy. I admit there's, you know, there's a good share of slapstick there too, because, you know, I, you know, just love having somebody fall down a flight of stairs and, um, <laughs> But I think, that, I think that we're starved today to find things that make us smile and that make us feel good. And, that, that we, and, and I think that people are drawn to this, not just to Stephanie, but to the product out there, whatever it is, whether it's a book, a movie, um, you know, a face cream, anything, that, that makes us happy, makes us feel good, and, and restores our faith in the human condition. And, uh, and I think, you know, Stephanie has a little of this. I think this is some of the appeal for the Plum series in general. And, um, and I think we also, we all like, you know, seeing Stephanie, um, seeing, seeing the, the things that happen to Stephanie, seeing her struggle with these two hot guys, you know. And I mean, and let's face it, I mean, you know, we read this series because of the two hot guys. <laughs> I know that's why I write it. <laughs> There's a lot of you in Stephanie, isn't there? <laughs> well, after he's following that statement up with, "There's a lot of me in Stephanie." Um, there's, I, I know who she is. I think, yeah, I think there's some of me in Stephanie. I mean, she's younger than I am. She's slimmer than I am. She has better metabolism. Um, you know, she, I would only admit to having one hot guy in my life. Um, so, uh, but we have the same history. We think alike lots of times. And that's how I keep a certain amount of honesty in the series is to um, pattern Stephanie after me a little bit. You know, when she's in a situation, I say, what would I do if I was Stephanie? Because we kind of came up together in the beginning. She didn't know anything about being a bounty hunter, and I didn't either. And, uh, <laughs> and now I still don't know a whole lot, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but I've learned how to wing it, you know, and Stephanie does that too. You know, earlier uh, tonight, uh I asked you if there was uh, any author who 
had influenced some of your work uh, early on and maybe someone still today. And you made an interesting comment about Robert B. Parker. Would you mind repeating that? Yeah, I said that um, when I moved from romance to, um, to crime fiction, I studied a lot, I did a lot of reading, and I really liked Robert B. Parker. Um, he's a wordsmith. His books are, I wanted to be the author that nobody had to struggle to read. And, uh, he, and he's um, very easy to read. His books are very linear. And, but what I really liked about him was that he had a hero who had a very strong sense of morality. He, he really knew where his moral compass was pointing. And, um, and, I, and I like that about Parker. I like that Spencer um, had a moral code, tried to do the right thing, and was a, a strong character. Did you ever think of maybe crossing over Stephanie Plum into uh, one of the other series and meeting the uh, protagonist in that second series? Um, and, you know, you know, I, uh, we've debated that, but I really like keeping them separate. I, the only time that I've ever done anything close to that was um, I started having some uh, holiday books, and I brought in a character, Diesel, into the world of Plum. Yeah, and, uh, and the reason I did it was I actually, I, I had this idea for Diesel, uh, this idea that there would be this big, scruffy, you know, sexy guy who, who was just a little bit, he, he had skills that were a little bit beyond normal. He, I mean, he wasn't a werewolf, you know, he wasn't a superhero. He just had the ability, and it occurred to me that there are people living among us, possibly, that this could actually be true. You know how, you know, some people always manage to find the parking place? You know, well, they have, you know, this special skill. Um, you know, some, some guys, you know, just know how to make ladies happy. They have this special skill. So, um, so I thought, wouldn't it be fun to, to have a whole sort of network of these people who were loose, loosely connected? And I would have this big guy, Diesel, who would sort of be like a bounty hunter for these special people, you know, much like Stephanie is a bounty hunter. And I presented it to St. Martin's, and they were really worried about me um, starting this brand new series. And um, that were the people going to come to a new series, or were they only interested in reading Stephanie Plum? And they asked me if I would introduce him um, in the Plum series, which I thought was pretty weird because, I mean, here's Stephanie, you know, living in Trenton, New Jersey, this ultra normal person, you know, from a blue collar family. And here I'm bringing, you know, this guy who. <laughs> Um, you know, who, who can unlock a door and who can um, disappear and do all these things. And, but anyway, we made him a holiday kind of guy. And when he was there, Joe and, and Ranger were not there. And we did four books like that. And he became so popular that finally I got permission to spin him off and to give him his own series. And so we had, um, we had two books um, that he did, Wicked Appetite and Wicked Business. And I would love to do more books. Um, I just, I don't have time, I can't write fast enough. But that was the closest that I've ever come to, to mixing them. Um, and, and, but the truth is, I really, I like keeping the world separate. Um, it's probably just because I enjoy being able to leave one world and go into a next. I find that when I go out of Stephanie's head and I move into another series and I'm in another heroine's head, um, like like Kate in the heist, um, I I always come back knowing more about Stephanie. I see her from a new perspective because um, I've 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 been in um, in in someone else's mind and that person operated differently and had different motivations. And I come back to Stephanie Plum and I I always feel like there's a little growth in the series from that be, just because of the way that I write after that experience. Interesting. In, in most of the Plum books, Janet, you have some sort of zany subplot going on. Uh, for instance, in Notorious 19, uh, it's a Hawaiian tiki totem. 
in, in takedown 20 is a giraffe named Kevin, who you referenced earlier, who's running amok in the hood. So where does this stuff come from? And, <laughs> and, and, and what are your dreams like, Jen? I, it's scary, right? <laughs> You know, um, I don't know. My dreams were not getting into my dreams, but um, I, you know, I, I don't know. It. I, I wake up in the morning and my head is filled with all of this stuff, and uh, and I have a couple good hours, you know, where it comes out um, onto the computer screen, uh, and then I, I keep working, you know, after that. But it, you know, it's pretty much trash time. Um, but you know, I, I don't know. I think. See, I, I have um, my own theory about creativity. I think that people are like jelly donuts. And, um, you know, God made the jelly donut, and originally it didn't have any jelly in it. And he, uh, then he came and he squirted all the jelly in. He piped the jelly into the middle of the jelly donut. And so now he has all of these jelly donuts that are filled with jelly, and when you come and you squeeze the donut, wherever that jelly squirts out, that's where your creativity is. So it could squirt out in one place and you could be like this great plumber or a shoe salesman or a writer or, um, you know. And so my, um, my jelly squirts out in, um, in this thing that gives me these weird ideas. Not to be too personal, Janet, but what flavor is your jelly? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's strawberry. Uh, this is a long question. Stephanie inhabits a surreal world, and it's one in which she appears to be the most balanced resident, or should I say in inmate. For instance, Grandma Mazur carries a Glock in her purse and once shot a cooked chicken at the dinner table. Yeah, but it's Jersey. Uh, the plus size Lula, who file, who's a file clerk in the bail binds office, uh, where Stephanie works, and she's Stephanie's occasional bounty hunting partner. She can say and do the most politically incorrect things imaginable. <laughs> Yet, in the context of Stephanie's universe, both Grandma Mazer and Lula seem normal. <laughs> How is that possible? And? <laughs> Next question. See, see I, I, I love Lula. Um, first of all, let me say, let me say that I have a campaign against all political correctness. I am totally against it. I try to insult everybody equally. Um, I, I think, you know, we have, you cannot legislate kindness. And we have this idea that we can label all of these things as being politically incorrect, and that's going to make us kinder, gentler, more sane, more forgiving people. And that is not true. That, that is, all that stuff comes from the heart, and political correctness comes from some misguided politician. <laughs> so I am doing my part <laughs> to be as politically incorrect as I can. And I can do this through Lula, um, because Lula was a hoe. Lula has attitude. Lula is is bigger than life. Lula is Stephanie on steroids. And <laughs> and we forgive Lula because we know what kind of a heart Lula has. We know that this woman um, is a good person. Okay, so she occasionally shoots people in the foot. But <laughs> aside from that, she um, and and there is a moment in this book for, for you know, I don't want to ruin it for all you people who have not taken the time to read it yet. 
Well, okay, I won't, I won't tell you then. Um, but there, there's a, a time in the, in the book where uh, Lula wants to buy a new handbag. And it's very expensive, and she doesn't have the money for the handbag. And actually, she bought a handbag from some guy um, selling them out of the trunk of his car. And, um, and it, it was supposed to be a Brahmin. I don't know if you know what Brahmin handbags are, but she had decided she wanted a Brahmin. And she, so she gives him five bucks for this um, <laughs> handbag that he says is a genuine. And, and she gets it to the office, and Connie looks at it, and you know it has a little gold plaque on it that says what it is. And she says, this isn't a Brahmin, it's a Brackman. And so then, um, for the rest of the book, Lula is trying to be able to afford a, a Brahmin handbag. And at one point, she decides the only way she's going to do it is to go back on the street. And so, um, she, uh, so she goes off, and, you know, and, and she's telling Stephanie that you know, she wants a Brahmin handbag because this is a lady's bag. And Stephanie says, you know, like you're selling yourself on the street to buy a lady's bag. I don't know if that's going to work. <laughs> So um, anyway, you have to read it to see if she actually, you know, makes enough to get the Brahmin bag. <laughs> Family entanglements and bingo uh, are key parts of the Plum series. Your husband, your son, your daughter, they all play integral roles in the family business. And I'm thinking readers are wondering if they're, shall we say, as distinctly unique as your fictional characters? For instance, what will Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, and Christmas be like at Casa de Plum in Naples, Florida? Will anyone come to the table armed? Um, probably not armed, but we're actually having Hanukkah giving this year um, because my son-in-law is Jewish, so um, we're going to have um, a menorah right alongside of the turkey and the brisket, and um, there'll be 11 of us at the table. Uh, we all, all, you know, relatives. We're, we're a small family, but we're very close. And uh, I'm sure somebody is going to knock over the menorah and set the tablecloth on fire. That will <laughs> be the highlight of our Hana giving. <laughs> you know, on the subject of secondary characters, Janet, I, I've heard that Grandma Mazer is a combination of real relatives from your past. Yeah, she's, um, I'm related to Grandma Mazer. She's a combination of my uh, Grandma Fanny and my Aunt Lena. And they were um, just amazing ladies that um, age was just a number for them, as it should be for all of us. And uh, I, I grew up in this extended family. Um, we all lived together in this house in South River, New Jersey. It was kind of an immigrant town. And we didn't have a lot of recreation, but we had two really kick-ass funeral parlors. <laughs> and so... Um, every afternoon, all the ladies in the neighborhood would come over to my Aunt Lena's kitchen and they'd sit around the table and go over the obits and decide who they were going to, you know, see that day. <laughs> and, um, and they really, and Resum was always the first choice. Um, and, you know, if you didn't know anybody that died, they didn't care. They would just, you know, probably go to Resum's anyway because he had better cookies. And he, um, he had a woman who did really great makeup. So you always look very lifelike, and um, and so and that was you know that was my childhood. So a lot of what you see in the Plum series actually, yeah, that's you know that's that's part of my family. That's extraordinary. <laughs> um. And he wonders where my ideas come from. <laughs> On the, on, to continue that theme, have you populated uh, many of your books with other people who you knew or, or know, such as friends, business associates, teachers, editors, publicists? Uh, and if so, have they recognized themselves? Yeah, nobody's safe. Nobody. Nobody. I had, uh, I had lunch with Cindy today. Where's Cindy? Okay, you're, you're done. You're... <laughs> Yeah, count your days because, <laughs> yeah, no, nobody is safe. I, um, I especially like to, like, my, my daughter has a three-year-old now. So, you know, she's, like, become mom, and she used to always tour with me, but she's home with my grandson. But we would, we would go out doing research, 
you know, and we would, um, we would sit at a bar and um, I'd be there with my little notepad, you know, and Alex would be sitting next to me with her little short skirt, you know, and her five inch heels and some guy would come up to her. And this is how I got like all of my good pickup lines for, <laughs> you know, for Morelli and, and uh, you know, and, and, you know, Ranger. Well, maybe not Ranger, because he's so cool, he doesn't say anything. You know, he's just like, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, um, so, so we did, a, we did a lot of that kind of stuff. And, and I'm, you know, and I am a voyeur, you know, and I walk the dog and look in people's windows at night, see what they're doing. Um, and so every now and then, people will recognize, they'll, they'll think they, you know, recognize themselves. But I try to make combinations of people, you know, so that I don't get sued. Because it's, uh, you have to be careful. Well, let's talk about how all this started. Uh, from your career as an artist to the, quote, thunderbolt moment, uh, when you realized that you like storytelling more than painting pictures. I know that was a rocky road. Yeah. Um... Well, I, I was always the kid that could draw. So um, I was, um, uh, I majored in art when I went to Douglas College, which is the state school in New Jersey. And, and then um, I got married and I was a stay-at-home mom. And um, I was painting and, um, you know, baking bread and, you know, doing all this. I was, you know, earth mother. Uh, and. Uh, and I was I was becoming dissatisfied with the painting part of it. Um, it just it wasn't um, it just it just wasn't satisfying. What I learned was that I I liked the communication. I I liked um, audience. I I found that I could be funny and I liked that. I liked that I could entertain people. And and I realized that I was always telling myself stories about the things that I was painting. So I decided that I was going to try to write. And I, I have to admit, at the time, um, we were struggling. My husband has his doctorate in mathematics. And he was teaching at a university level. But you know, I was a stay-at-home mom. And he wasn't making that much money. So, and we don't, we don't come from a family that has money. I have a very blue-collar background. My dad worked in a factory. And like we would you know, we'd get a phone call at 9 o'clock at night. And, um, and my Aunt Lena would say, you know, Uncle Mickey needs some new false teeth. Do you have any money? <laughs> and we'd be like scrounging around, you know, and I'd say, well, yeah, you know, I got $7. Does that help? You know, and so, um, so what I thought was, you know what? I'm going to write a book. I'll sell it to the movies. I'll be rich and famous. <laughs> and then 10 years later, <laughs> I finally sold a book. I was a, I was a real slow learner, and part of the problem was that I was a product of the Douglas Art Department, and what we knew was that um, you, you do art for yourself, and if someone else comes to, to that painting or that sculpture and finds something in it, that's great, but that's not why you do it. You do it for yourself. You bring something of yourself out. Well, that didn't work. That because I was writing these really weird stories, um, I, you know, uh, this woman who lived in a fairy forest in Pennsylvania and uh, lived in a tree with a big bird, you know, and anyway, I was not able to sell that book. <laughs> and I was not able to sell <laughs> the four books that followed that. And so, at some point, um, nine, ten years down the road, it occurred to me that um, not only was this a frustrating experience, but I wasn't enjoying it. I was doing these stories. I was liking physically writing. I was loving the process. But I was, I was missing the communication. And, and I realized that, that that wasn't me, that why I wanted to write was to entertain people and to communicate with people. And that as long as those people were not reading my stories, it wasn't working for me. And that was another one of those thunderclap moments. And I was writing, um, I was reading romance novels at the time. I was a young wife and mother and I was in love and it was what was appropriate for me. So I decided I was going to um, try to write one of those little books. 
and I read a lot, and I made lists, and um, and I finally, I wrote a romance novel, and um, I had it rejected, and I wrote a second one, and I sent it out, and, um, and more rejections. So after 10 years of this, I, I had started collecting rejections in a shoebox, and then I had them in a shirt box, <laughs> and then I had them in a big packing crate. And it was filled with rejections. And I had been doing this for a long time, and I was getting really discouraged. My family was great. They were always saying, you know, you can do it, Mom. My husband had two jobs, so I didn't have to take one. But, I, you know, but I reached a point where I just, um, I, I didn't have the heart to do it anymore. So I took that big packing crate out, and I sat on the curb. And I burned all those rejections. Now, I really wish I had them now, because I had rejections that were written in crayon on the back of bar napkins from agents. So anyway, I burned all these rejections and I borrowed a suit from my sister and I went to Manpower and got a job working as a temp. And um, four months down the road, I was, um, I was at a skating rink um, because my daughter was taking, she would take ice skating lessons after school. And my husband and my son came in and they put their arms around me and they said, your editor just called. And, um, this, okay, this is the part where I cry. <laughs> so, um, and it was, uh, and that was, that was how I finally got pu published. And it turned out that um, a junior editor read my book that I had submitted and liked it. And she took it to her senior editor and the woman um, didn't like it. But this junior editor really believed in it and she put it in her desk drawer for four months. And when her senior editor was in a better mood, it took four months, I guess, I don't know. Um, <laughs> She, she brought it out and gave it to her, and the woman liked it and bought it. You know, by the grace of God, that's, that's how I got published. And um, they paid me $2,000, and, I, and um, I, so I immediately quit my temp job. I came in the next day. <laughs> I came in the next day with a dozen donuts, and I put it on my desk, and I said I quit, and I took my can of hairspray and my extra pair of shoes out of the bottom drawer, and I left. And I didn't sell another book for a year. We had to stop eating oranges, you know. It was <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of uh, that year, I got a contract um, to sell two more books, and then I got another contract to sell more books, and I ended up doing nine romance novels. Um, in a five-year period. And it was, you know, that M Mickey Spillane thing where they say, how long does it take you to write a book? And he says, how bad do I need the money? <laughs> it was, you know, it was a little like that. Um, and then they sort of kicked me out of romance um, because I kept sneaking in mysteries. And I was, I was their token humor writer. There wasn't a lot of um, humor in romance at the time. It was very serious stuff. We had, we had vocabulary back then that we had to use. And I go back now, we republished my romance novels and, um, and I think they're charming. But every now and then I look at some of this language that we had to slip in, like there was a lot of turgid nipples. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> I know you like reading that, but you know, I don't, I don't know if it's, you know, if it's relevant anymore, turgid nipples, but um, you know, we, we had to say, you know, that he had his manhood. Um, he had, um, we had engorged manhoods. And, and, and I was from Jersey, you know, I mean, it was like, it's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, um, so I moved over into crime and they let me say that. And, um, and, and that, was, uh, that was how I started the Plum series. I uh, did a lot of reading for a year and um, uh, saw the movie Midnight Run with Charles Grodin and Robert De Niro and thought that's pretty cool um, because there weren't bounty hunters out there then. This was before Dog. Um, I was, you know, now, I mean, they're, you know, they're, you, you know, throw a rock, you hit a bounty hunter on television, but, um, but it was something new and I thought it was fun and she could wear whatever kind of shoes she wanted to wear. It wasn't like, you know, she was a cop and she had to wear those cop shoes. So, um, you know, cause she's a Jersey girl. And that was, um, that was how the Plum series got started. And I, you know, I have no idea what the original question was, but. <laughs> But I, I think I probably answered it. <laughs> Hi, Jenna. He's, he's still on turgid nipples, I think. <laughs> yes, I am. You know, you, you told me in an earlier conversation, quote, I think of myself as an entertainer with a calling to make people happy and make them think they're not alone. That the people who don't do everything right manage to get by in the end because they don't give up. That's a pretty humble, rather noble statement. <laughs> can, can we go back to the turgid nipples? I like that better. Um, That's okay. We'll move on. Well, but, but no, I'm. It, but it, it's true. Um, I do think of myself as an entertainer. Um, I know I'm a writer. I think that I have pretty decent writing skills. I work very hard at it. I work hard, so you guys don't have to. But I like the idea that I entertain, and I like the idea that I can maybe make people smile at some point in the book. I mean, I don't, I don't think that, you know, I'm not gonna change the world, but if, uh, if you put my book down and you don't feel like kicking the dog, I'm happy. <laughs> I think that's a good thing. Over the past decade, Janet, you've been involved in four series with other writers. The most recent is the Kate O'Hare, Nicholas Fox series. Uh, with The Heist, was, which was released this year. I listened to it on uh, audio uh, in my car. I liked it a lot. And you've got The Chase coming out next year. Your co-writer is award-winning Hollywood writer Lee Goldberg. So, oh, can you tell us about that dynamic, how that works? Yeah, um, I've been friends with Lee for a, a long time. Um, I think something like book two, I was on tour in California, and he came by to say hello. And, uh, and we've been friends ever since. And one day... Um, not too long ago, we were talking and I said, gee, you know, we should write a book together. And I've had other co-authors with varying degrees of success. Um, and uh, I wrote a bunch of books with Charlotte Hughes. I did one with Liam Banks. Um, I, I had a disastrous experience with Steve Cannell. We were, we were gonna um, co-author a book together and it turns out that we're really good at, in a bar together, but as co-authors, <laughs> we almost killed each other. We just had, um, but but Lee and I get along really well, and he has. Um, we're we're good at different things. He's very good at plotting. Actually, he's insane. He's a total maniac. I, I'll be honest with you. I I get like emails at three thirty in the morning. I just finished chapter twenty. Did you read it yet? No, I'm asleep, Lee. <laughs> Um, but he's, um, he's good at plotting. He has great ideas. He did, um, he was the, uh, the writer and executive producer for Diagnosis Murder with Dick Van Dyke. He wrote the, um, the ad adaptations, the Monk books. He wrote a lot of the Monk series. So he has, um, he has this, uh, you know, good, solid background of thinking fast and writing fast and having discipline and writing for television. And, um, and uh, I, I have a second 
um, series being started now with another co-author, um, a guy that I've known for a long time too, and a friend of Lee's, his name is Fief Sutton, and he has three Emmys. Um, he wrote and uh, executive produced Cheers, um, among other things. And, um, and what I've decided is that I, I like working with these guys because first of all, they bring a new perspective um, to it. I'm very good at writing the women. They suck at writing the women. They're good at, um, at the plot line and all those intricacies. And for me, the plot is just a railroad track that I put my trains on, you know, it's not. Um, and, and the really good thing is, is that when you yell at them, they don't cry. Can we get a little peek at the uh, second uh, O'Hare Fox uh, piece uh, novel coming up, The Chase, due in a few months? Yeah, The Chase comes out in February, and um, we just got the entire manuscript in. Uh, we're in the editing process now. It's a lot of fun. It really is a lot of fun. It has an amazing ending. Um, it has a really um, cool um, bad guy in it. Um, it has a, a woman um, who is a killer, and Kate has this, um, well, okay, we cut it down. It was like an 11-page fight scene, <laughs> you know, which I thought was, okay, maybe a little too extensive. It took place in the belly of a plane of one of these big, um, you know, jumbo uh, jet things. And it's about, um, it's about a, a, a Chinese artifact that was in the Smithsonian and turns out was a fake and um, the Chinese government wants their artifact back. And so, um, so they have this whole elaborate plot to, to get this back. But it's, um, it's a lot of fun. I love it because it has all these exotic locations. I wanted to do a series, you know, Stephanie is so local and so regional, and it's so much of what I know. Um, I wanted to do a real adventure story with Lee, I, and he's very well traveled. Um, I wanted to do an adventure story that was in a lot of exotic locations, and he's very good at description. And because I'm like, I'm such a workaholic, you know, like I do all my traveling with Anthony Bourdain. I don't know if you know who that is on, you know, on the Travel Channel. I mean, that's, uh, that's as far as I go. Um, so, uh, but this one, um, they're in Dubai and um, they're in uh, Hong Kong and, um, you know, they're just all over the place and I think that's a lot of fun. Um, you wrote two uh, graphic novels. Uh, I don't mean graphic in that sense, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's um, those turgid nipples, he can't get away from them. <laughs> I'll never recover. Um, you have two graphic novels with your daughter, Alex, and they are the third and fourth installments in the Wicked series, essentially. Uh, are, were you two still speaking by the time they were uh, published? Yeah, yeah, no, and actually, it isn't the Wicked series. It was, um, we did two um, books that were NASCAR related, because uh, I'm, I'm a big NASCAR fan, and so was Alex. And so um, we did two books um, about a race driver and, um, and they were graphic novels. We had a very talented artist who worked with us, Dark Horse Comics, put them out. And, um, and we, we had a lot of fun doing it. We just loved it. And I think they turned out great. And then we combined them into one book. We called it Troublemaker. And, um, and it's, uh, it's still out there. And yeah, you know, I, I work very closely with my family. We're, we're like a little herd. We all move around together. My, um, my son is my finance officer and my agent, and my daughter, Alex, is, um, she uh, does everything associated with the internet and social media. She interfaces with my publisher, with Random House. She um, works with my publicist. She, she does um, all of that stuff, and Peter and Alex are always my first editors. Uh, the book doesn't go into Random House until they clear it until they think that it's ready to go. So, um, and we're, um, we live in the same neighborhood. We, um, we see each other all the time. I, I have a chef, um, not that I'm that fancy, but nobody wants to eat my cooking and it's not cost effective for me to try to cook. So, and besides that, see, I found this thing, like if you have a chef, your kids come back all the time. <laughs> you get to see them. 
So, uh, so they come over for lunch, and we have, uh, we have business meetings. And we do. We actually, we even like each other. It's, um, it's good. And I should, I should take this opportunity to tell you um, about my son, because I was supposed to be here a year ago. And um, in October, in the beginning of October, uh, my son, who is 43 now, was diagnosed with leukemia. This is this huge, healthy guy who doesn't drink, never did drugs, didn't smoke, ate organic, you know, should have taken him to McDonald's for crying out loud, um, came down with leukemia. So um, we flew him, I live, in, I live in Naples, Florida, we flew him to Mass General. And uh, literally, I threw some underwear and a couple T-shirts and socks in a bag, and we chartered a plane because he couldn't fly commercial. And his wife and I, he hadn't even been married a year, his wife and I flew to Mass General with him. And um, we, uh, he had a bone marrow biopsy the day that he went in, and um, none of us left until the beginning of December, the mid middle of December. He was... Um, went through chemo, um, was placed in remission, and his wife, Pechka, and I stayed um, in Boston for that whole time. She was his night nurse, I was his day nurse. Amazing hospital, Mass General. Um, if uh, I can't say enough about it, uh, incredible leukemia floor, wonderful nurses, super talented doctors. And so, um, so that was why I had to I had to miss seeing you guys last year, but he uh, he came out of the hospital in December, and he had um, a bone marrow transplant March 1st because they found a perfect donor for him, and he um, and he is just perfect. He's if you saw him, yeah, thank you. It's, it's pretty amazing. You know, it used to be a death sentence to have leukemia um, not that long ago, but with the way that they match up bone, uh, 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 actually it's a stem cell transplant that they do now. Um, it's pretty amazing. And he was a healthy guy to begin with. And so if you saw him today, you'd think he was a big faker because he doesn't, you know, he doesn't look, uh, he doesn't look sick. He's playing tennis and he's back at work and, uh, and you know, he's just fine. So, but anyway, I want to thank you all for being so understanding last year when I couldn't be here. Thank you. Audiobooks, they're a growing presence in the book world and it's agreed within the industry and among listeners that the right reader is crucial to the storytelling. Lorelai King is the definitive voice of Stephanie and the other characters in Plum Land. A, a Stephanie audiobook just would not be nearly as satisfying without her. Uh, I imagine you two must have devoted time to discussing the characters, their motives, their quirks, before she begins recording. Um, I love Lorelai. We've become really good friends. Um, she actually lives in London. Um, she's an American, uh, married to a Brit, and, uh, and she's in London, and she's also a very talented actress. But Lorelai is also a fan, and she read the books, and she just got it. And uh, once in a while, she'll call up and, you know, she'll say, how do you pronounce this name? Um, and maybe way back when she started, we might have had some um, discussions, but not a lot, you know, because... Um, she she just understood who these people were. She loved the books, and she's very very talented, and she just got it. So, um, and and you're right. I mean, she is the voice of Stephanie. We had in the beginning we had several people doing the series. Um, Lorelai came in. Um, I don't know what number book. Uh, uh, maybe about halfway through, and I can't imagine. You know, doing the Plum series without her now, she does a great job. Mm -hmm. And and audio books, I mean, are they're so changing the the way that we read and the way that we listen to audio books is you know every day it's it's something different out there. So much of my sales are eBooks now, and even in the audio books are you know downloads. You know, um, after years of waiting, a long time. Uh, Hollywood finally got around to making the movie of your first Plum book, One for the Money. 
But last year you said something really, uh, and that we found really intriguing. You noticed that the grittiness in the book was more than the grittiness, no, no, that the grittiness in the movie really reflected the grittiness in that book, mm -hmm. and that your publisher asked you to be, quote, blue, more blue sky and less gritty in, in successive novels. But your point was is that that movie really captured how, to use the word gritty, the first book out of the shoot was. Had your publisher not said something about, could you make it a little more blue sky, would we have seen that dark side a little more? Um, yeah, I think so. When I first started, um, when I wrote One for the Money, um, there was a very graphic, violent scene with Lula on the fire escape, and the bad guy was really a bad guy, was this crazy boxer. And um, I think that I probably would have continued that. It probably would have been um, a, a little bit more violent, a little bit more gritty book. I always knew that if there was horrific violence, it would happen off stage. We might see the results of it, but um, I never wanted to do on stage violence. Um, but when my my publisher perceived that my core audience um, probably would be more comfortable with with less violence, with a more blue skies book, and so um, I changed the direction of the book a little bit. And uh, you know, and I'm not I'm not sure. You know, some people really loved that first book and, um, you know, would like to see that kind of um, stuff some more. And, um, and a lot of people love the lighter treatment. So I don't know. But, you know, I'm kind of stuck with where I am now, being that I did one gritty book in 19 that, that have, uh, you know, a little bit lighter touch to it. Um, I, I, I like the movie. The movie, um, I thought Katherine Heigl was a great Stephanie. I've never had, yeah, I, I have never had, um, aside from Sandra Bullock, I mean, we could all see Sandra Bullock as Stephanie. <laughs> but um, for a variety of reasons, you know, that didn't work out, and Heigl came on. And I actually thought she did a great job as Stephanie. And I thought that the movie, was um, entertaining and reflected the quality of that very first book. Um, you know, there were things in the movie that maybe I would not have done exactly like that, but overall I thought it was a good movie. Heigl had a terrible time with the critics. Um, they never forgave her for, you know, bad-mouthing Grey's Anatomy, I think, and so it was a real uphill battle. But I know a lot of my fans went to see the movie and they enjoyed it too, and, you know, they were hoping that there was going to be more, and so I'm pretty excited, you know, that maybe we can get a television series going because that would, that would be great. Is it too early or is there any thought given to who might place Stephanie on television? Yeah, no, um, they have not even thought about casting yet. It's, um, it's a process, you know, you, first of all, you find somebody who's interested in it and then they have to go pitch it and what they pitch is um, to write a pilot. And then if the studio likes the pilot, then they have to shoot the pilot, and then if they like the pilot that's shot, then you might be able to take it to series, you know. So we're just in the very, you know, beginning stages of it. But the people that are working on this project right now are like my dream team, and they're very talented people. So, um, you know, so I have, I have good hopes for this one. Janet, for years you were famously the single largest private purchaser of Cheetos in the world. <laughs> uh, still? Yeah, no, at some point my body just said, no, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's enough. I, but I have to say, there is something, you know, like it gets all my synapses working, that cheesy, crunchy, crappy stuff. And it would be, it would be that, I mean, you give me a glass of wine and a bag of pe Cheetos and I am so damn funny. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm just brilliant. I really am. And it used to be that when I was done with a book, 
they would have to throw my keyboard away and buy me a new one. Because <laughs> it like, it'd be all gummed up with that orange stuff, you know? And we'd be trying to chip it away and we wouldn't be able to get it clean and eventually, you know, we'd have to buy a new keyboard. But uh, yeah, no, I reached a point where it was like, look at a bag and projectile vomiting happened. It wasn't, wasn't good. Well, on the subject now, of now I just drink the wine and <laughs> it works better that way. That's your new go-to. You told me you like California Reds. I do, yeah. Okay. All right, once and for all. Morelli Rain. <laughs> but, but wait, but wait, before you answer that question, just please let me just do one thing. Who says Morelli? <laughs> Who says Ranger? Who says both? <laughs> so we know the answer to that one. <laughs> Janet, we want to thank you very much for your candor. There's one last question, which is, would you like to add anything? Um, no, I, I don't think I have anything to add, but um, it's been great being here. If you guys um, have books to sign, that's great. I, I never leave until the last book is signed. If you want to have pictures taken, that's, uh, that's okay too. If you want to leave and go home and get drunk, you can do that as well. So. Janet, thank, thank you very you. much.